And thank you all for coming here and, and being part of the rig process. Great. Thank you, Fred. So the COIL Research Initiation Grants, the purpose is to get research and development projects related to online innovation and learning started at Penn State University. The goal is, well, we have several goals. One is to stimulate the, the research and, and development around online innovations. The other is to stimulate the flow of external funding into Penn State to create the kind of place where we can do a lot more of that and bigger projects. So these are seed grants designed to be sort of proof of concept of the ideas, good ideas, so you get to build it, you get to show that, the, hey, it looks like it's working, and then you get to go to somebody else to, like NSF or Gates Foundation or other places, to really get the kind of money you need to really do something at, at scale. So that's the purpose. Another purpose was to sort of create more synergy and collaboration across faculty, staff, and students. So we understand that each of those three categories of people have a lot to offer, and you know none of them, well, with the possible exception of students, <laughs> can get everything done from the development through the, the testing and everything. So there's a lot to be gained by working together. We also want to create collaboration across sort of the, the silos in, at Penn State, across colleges. So we've asked for multidisciplinary kinds of approaches. And we've encouraged you to invite other people to work on teams with you and other campuses. So we have some projects that span uh, span University Park and other campuses, or some that originated other campuses. So we really want to take advantage of all the resources that exist in our many locations and the kinds of people that we have out there to do innovation. So what you're about to see is a series of 16 mini, three-minute whiz-bang, this is what we're doing and why. And uh, with that, I'll stop and we'll go to the first one. You're going to introduce them? One yes. Last? Okay. Thank you. Take Tom. it away. So we're going to start the first annual COIL Research Symposium with Chris Gamrat, the Penn State Lifelong Learning Landscape L3. Thank you. Um, so today I'm going to talk uh, for two minutes and 45 seconds about the lifelong learning landscape. Um, this is a proposal that we submitted last fall. Um, I, today I found out that I was the I'm the first one to talk because my name is alphabetically first, so the bar is here at this point. Um, and um, I'll try to keep it there. Um, so, um, the lifelong learning landscape, the idea was that um, Kyle and I were working on a NASA education grant um, in a collaboration with um, the National Science Teachers Association. We were trying to provide uh, teacher professional development for um, educators um, where they would be able to select and engage in professional development kind of at their own time and, and be able to receive feedback and, and um, have this repository of credentials. And I told Kyle that this is something that could be, really be something that we could take to and apply at the rest of the university. And he said, great idea. There's this thing called COIL that's going to have these um, you know, opportunities for grants. We should write a grant. And so we did. And this is the team. Or um, sometimes we refer to ourselves as the posse. Um, and so um, we have the project, hang on, there's a laser here, project champions. Um, that's myself and, and Chris Stubbs who conveniently, okay, he's, he's still here. So Chris Stubbs is also working, and we're really trying to advance this um, in a number of different perspectives. And this is, I think, a really great approach um, where we've, been, we've, we've had kind of um, tag teaming a lot of the discussions uh, from a, an approach where we're trying to create a platform for digital badging um, that supports a number of different use cases. Um, we can both kind of divide our time and really be able to um, build a system that meets all the needs of you know, a number of different stakeholders. We also have the uh, laser, laser. Uh, teaching, uh, teaching and Learning with Technology Group has really provided a lot of support in terms of, um, uh, in terms of feedback and development and, and resources to build this system. Um, we have also have a number of other people that apparently don't have time to talk to, but I really appreciate their support. Um, the system that we have involved uh, allows us to create, select, submit, evaluate, earn, share, and, and display uh, educational opportunities that, that students and faculty and staff have engaged in. And this is a platform that's really designed to be incredibly flexible and support that sort of, um, uh, that sort of development. Um, current status, we have a version one that's been launched on September 27th. We're looking, we have a number of people in various statuses uh, developing badges um, for their own use cases. 
Um, we're also working on uh, version two and beyond. We're integrating um, recommendations, social connections, um, exporting out to Mozilla uh, Digital Backpack. Um, and we're also working on uh, a, a NASA, pro uh, NASA proposal where we're going to be um, suggesting having, using this instance as also a repository for uh, online education. In addition to that, there are a number of um, research projects that are going on internal to um, Instructional Systems Now Learning Design Technology. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next one is going to be Glenn Johnson with developing an open source case based environment to support higher order learning. Glenn. So um, we are probably more of a development uh, project, uh, looking at case-based uh, learning environment, uh, look, you can look, uh, looking at cases as a way to improve understanding uh, throughout the program, throughout a program of study, rather than just in individual courses. Uh, a lot of uh, our students in statistics, I'm from the Department of Statistics, and they uh, have taken a number of courses, and then they get to the practicum where they apply all of those. We want to uh, use a case-based approach to try and take a look at that. So in our program, our project, what we did is we kind of tried to keep it simple, and so we tried to gather what we knew. Uh, we uh, determined what we need, and then we wanted to figure out how to get there. Uh, we uh, uh, then led to some design specs, which we would then build and then share. We have a website where we share all the information and meetings and all the kinds of things that took place as a part of our project uh, with everybody, because I think this is something that we wanted to share. Uh, with, with uh, folks. Uh, we reached out to a number of different programs that have similar types of case-based approaches where it could apply. Uh, forensics, science is certainly an area where you know, your students are presented with a case uh, to take a look at, well, how do I apply? What's going on here with this? Energy and sustainability policy, uh, landscape design, and we had them come to a meeting where they shared what they do in their classrooms and uh, how they, a case might ap uh, apply to what they're doing. Uh, we had a speaker come in from the, um, Dr. Ballard from uh, Hershey Medical School, and they do problem-based learning, which was really interesting for us to take a look at how uh, they start from like, well, the woman's coming into the emergency room with pain in her leg. What do you do? You know, and, and trying to build the curriculum around those kinds of revealing of information to apply what, what students are doing. We had uh, Tiffany Kozalka, who's a grad stu uh, Penn State grad. That was when Dr. Classes, when I was taking those classes back, uh, now she's up in Syracuse and is the department head up there, came down and talked to us about case-based design. Again, trying to find out how do they use case-based design to um, uh, apply it to what their, uh, their programs are. The gap is we want students to competently apply what they've learned, right? And a lot of our courses really uh, just focus on the coursework. And so we're, we're, how do we get them to apply what they learned in all of these courses? And that's really the, uh, the challenge. And so what we're trying to come up with is a, uh, an open source, uh, Drupal-based, something that anybody could use, interface that would allow us to present cases in a way that students can interact in that kind of a system. So where are we going now? I've got to take my notes out here. Um, what we're doing right now is that we have uh, a graduate student and we're or the Department of Statistics serving as a kind of a pilot. And uh, if you've watched that History Channel show, the Yukon Gold, I think it's called, where they take these massive amount of dirt and they put it through this wash plant. Well, we have massive amounts of cases in the consulting center, the uh, Statistics Consulting Center, and she's our wash plant. So she goes through all these cases and looking for those good uh, golden nuggets that we can u transform into instructional materials. Uh, we have a faculty member who's writing our cases. Um, in the fall semester, we're working with our uh, collaborators in the College uh, of Arch uh, Arts and Architecture to develop a prototype that we'll pilot in the spring. Uh, and we have uh, talks with a group that looks like they're going to do a follow-up on our case-based thing, a COIL grant that will initiate that, get them started. Uh, we're presenting at the uh, Statistical Consulting Conference in February and the International Conference on Teaching of Statistics this coming summer. So. Um, We've been pretty busy. <laughs> so next is going to be Robin Q with exploring an innovative framework of evolving best practices for effective online learning.
Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is a project. Uh, this is a team. Oh, my sorry. Push it the wrong way. That's our team. Uh, you, you can see here the project focuses on you know, how we can uh, investigate mechanisms for determining the best practice for active learning uh, in online environment. So we know uh, on, uh, on campus, you know, we appreciate the interactions, you know, uh, between students and those between students and the faculty. But online education, of course, is that part is missing. But the questions are how can we help students to get better interactions. So that's the focus. And in Century, you can see here what we can do to help students to get more engaged uh, in uh, online education environment. So our focus, you can see here, we'd like to determine the best approach. And since each class is different, you know, we have to understand what's going on with each given class. So this is an example you can see here. For a given class, we divide seven different modules. So each module will have one project. And we have the team uh, will be assigned for working on those projects. We try to understand how those teams, they interact with each other, how those students interact with instructors in, uh, uh, for each assignment. So we try to understand this, and we like to, you can see here, uh, this is a mathematical model, of course, I'm not going to spend time here. And in Century, you can see here, we did the uh, questionnaire at the very beginning and tried to get all those feedbacks from students. We did this already, you can see here. We finished six online classes already, collecting a lot of data. Then we built a model to understand all those factors impact on the outcomes. Then we did one, you can see here, specific for a given class. We tried to understand the interactions between all the students. Then you can see here, because the students will build those uh, networks. So we'd like to see why a given student is so active, the other ones are not. And what this outcome will be because some ones are so active. What we can do to help the other ones to you know, be more engaged in the classroom, of course, online environment. So this is what I've been doing, as a matter of fact. And you can see the next step, since we did the force around and we collect a lot of data, we like to continue to analyze, you know, if we make some changes, what that change will impact the outcomes. And then, of course, the facts, we will, you know, build the software to help instructors in the long run, not just for my class, you know, for all other you know, uh, instructors, they are teaching online education. Of course, I'm, I missed a lot with one here. So you can see here, of course, the project, we do need more money. We will look for an you know, answer for grant based on the fantastic outcome we have so far. And we'll continue to build that, you know, like I said, in the, in the spring. So we'll have uh, three more classes to go. Uh, that's the uh, report from this group. Thank you so much. So the next is going to be <clears throat> Larry Reagan with teaching styles that enable online learning su success. Good, thank you, Fred. Thank you. Uh, boy, I don't have lots of really nifty, cool images like that. So maybe I'll just use uh, Robin's. <laughs> so, uh, okay. So our our team uh, modified our title just slightly into uh, ATM, which is an adaptive teaching model, and it's based upon some research we did primarily looking at uh, student. Uh, ex, um, I'm sorry, teaching behaviors that enable uh, faculty members to be successful online. We wanted to ask students which of those behaviors uh, would be helpful for, for them getting through their course. So we focused on, this is our previous model called COTS, Competencies for Online Teaching Success, which has now been, that, that uh, research is now taken and embedded into the faculty development programs delivered through the World Campus. This is the one we're working on currently, which is the adaptive teaching model. Uh, this one was a faculty focus, looking at their teaching behaviors. The student focus now is looking at the teaching behaviors that students describe uh, as having helped them. So our, our questions were looking at a profile of a learner. If we can get a sense of who they are in their self-directedness, their self-management, um, can we match those up with descriptions of teaching behaviors that they said help them get through their scenario. So for example, if an individual uh, ranks low on self-directiveness according to the scale or measurement tool we're going to administer, and then depending on how they respond to a series of, of questions about which of the teaching, when a teacher did this, did this, 
uh, did this help you? Uh, our belief is that there will be differences, by the way, between the way fa faculty describe these perceptions and how students prescribe these um, perceptions. So our ultimate goal is to enable the online instructor to adapt their teaching behavior to whom they have in the classroom based on this profile tool. So I won't go through all of these in detail, but uh, the idea is that we started with COTS. We're moving now to a, a model where we can assess the uh, a profile of the individual using a particular self-directed profile tool, which will then match up to how they responded on which of those teaching behaviors helped them. Uh, we've done a number of uh, processes already. We have had external reviewers last week look at the project, gave us great feedback. We're now getting ready to construct the final questionnaire and uh, deliver it. So this is inappropriate for this, right? Because I'm not going to take questions. So, okay, so um, any other questions, you can pass them on. But, hey, was I under time? Yes. Just for the record. So where's my team? He's going to... He's going to donate his 30 seconds to the next presenter. So next is Kevin Sparks with Enhancing Online Geospatial Education with Sketch-Based Geospatial Learning Objects. All right, so starting quick, um, my name is Kevin. I'm a first-year master's student in geography. I'm here today on behalf of Alex Klippel, who couldn't make it as well as uh, Anthony Robinson. Um, so moving on. Okay. Um, I won't reiterate the title as it's already, um, even though it's not on my uh, slide, but as many of you know, um, one of the difficulties in online education is trying to provide um, dynamic rather than uh, static content. So in summary, um, two of our project goals are trying to determine um, efficient and effective ways of designing and delivering um, dynamic educational uh, content via an extensive evaluation of uh, sketch-based software as well as trying to provide a library of uh, sketch-based learning objects um, for geospatial concepts and provide them uh, to educators and students alike. Um, so modularity, uh, modularity as an idea, kind of taking a large complex concept and bringing it down into uh, digestible kind of five minute uh, videos, uh, breaking it down into smaller components to increase uh, accessibility um, for students. Um, there, of course, is a lot of existing work in developing uh, learning objects uh, which supports modularity. Um, we are not ignorant of this, um, and we look to explore more uh, systematic ways of enhancing this process. Uh, modularity has been used within uh, computer science and software development very successfully, and we think it's time to bring it, on, uh, bring it into um, online education. Um, so coupling uh, modularity with uh, geographic concepts um, via sketching is what we're trying to do. Sketching being uh, simultaneous action capture and commentary in the form of uh, videos. And I'm actually surprisingly going to try to show you a quick example of it right now. Here we go. Um, and if we move to uh, queen contiguity, we again consider uh, which are the neighboring cells of the cell in the middle. We're looking right here. And just like in chess, we are allowed to move in both the horizontal and vertical direction, but also in the direction of the diagonals, uh, meaning we can consider neighbors as those cells that share at least one point. So I'll stop it there for time. I apologize for my surprisingly deep voice on that. <laughs> Weird. Uh, but so uh, the, just to wrap things up, um, the we're using a tablet-based application called Explain Everything. Um, we've looked across other, uh, a wide array of um, tablet-based applications as well as non-tablet-based applications. Um, and for the sake of time, I'll just say this fit uh, best for us. Um, and lastly, of course, these videos aren't um, just restricted to uh, geography. Um, we hope to eventually um, get enough uh, contributors to create kind of a snowball effect that um, induces a self-sustaining site for educators and students. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So next is going to be Ann Clements with presenting a committee on institutional, institutional cooperation, MOOC con content curriculum collaborative connectedness. Great. So Thank you thing. very much. Um, let's see where we're we here. Oh. So, Sadie, so, you're going to um, think it and you're going to audit it. Turn the your volume head. down. We're going to keep this way going because we're all together with the meter, okay? Let's try it. Mm -hmm. This county gets my time. 
started out with music. What? Um, thank you, that's fine. I am faculty in music education, and my primary job is teacher training people who want to be music teachers in K-12 education. And I uh, would like to thank Rita very much for setting up this talk beautifully. Um, I'm teaching one of those foundational level classes that is a drain on me, that is a drain on resources at the university, that compounds student schedules and is riddled um, with a lot of problems. And um, I thought, I can't be alone in this. Every institution offering music education must be suffering with this also. So I thought, why not work together? So I thought, who could I work with? The CIC, the academic arm of the Big Ten. And so if, if I'm having these troubles, so are they. We have 13 out of 15 CIC institutions that offer a music education degree program, and we meet annually. We know each other well. So the concept was, let's rebuild a foundational level music education course, offered in a MOOC-like way, a walled MOOC-like way, to CIC faculty and institutions. And the interesting thing about MOOCs to me is the social connectedness and collaboration um, that students have when they're participating in this class. And I thought, let's flip that. Can we have faculty collaborate and um, get together prior to the MOOC ever being constructed um, and create it uh, from that angle? So um, I sent out an invitation to the CIC faculty. Um, they can participate in this. Uh, project in three ways. They can contribute content, they can help construct curricular materials, um, and then hopefully they'll use it on their campus. Is it a MOOC when we have this walled off approach and only offering it within the CIC? No. <laughs> and yes. Is it massive? No. Is it open? No. Is it online? Yes. Is it a course? What is a course in a MOOC? I'm not really sure. Is it a module? Is it a course? I don't know. Um, so we're kind of in uncharted territory here, but there is um, one example at Harvard in a class called Copyright that walled and limited enrollment. So we're kind of following that um, attempt. And our research is really looking at the collaborative process of, cr of um, creation and in the teaching module. How great would it be if a Penn State student could post a question about content that everyone has viewed and a faculty member at Northwestern answers, or a group of students at Indiana help to answer the question or provide new questions. And that's the model we're trying to create. Um, right now at level one, creating short My name is Dr. four Kathy to seven Strand, minute long I'm videos, um, TED-like talks. I have 29 faculty from 12 of the 13 institutions lined up to create these with us. Um, we're going to start creating curricular materials in the spring. Um, and then use the module all of next year and collect data um, throughout that process. So I very much feel like we're ready to go on this great adventure together. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Okay, so the next is going to be Joanna DeFranco with the online team collaboration framework. Thank you. Hi. I have no videos or equations in mine. <laughs> um, okay. There we go. Okay, this is my team. Um, we developed in the past a collaborative model that uh, teams that use this model were more effective. So we moved on to determining if the, the effective teams were actually learning more in the classroom, and we determined they were. Um, and then finally, we wanted to see if the students were individually learning more if they were on an effective team using the model that we started out with. And we found out they were not. So, um, which I guess was good news after I thought about it because that started new research to figure out uh, how we can get them to learn more. So we're going to take our e existing model and modify it uh, to make sure that, at, that teams that use it are more effective and the individuals on those teams learn more. Um, we're going to do that with uh, uh, both uh, quantitative and, and qualitative analysis. Um, the quantitative will do uh, pre and post testing of the students. Uh, we've also um, developed a way with uh, concept maps to uh, calculate it, that the students are actually converging on a uh, similar or uh, more convergent mental model than the teams that were not using uh, this uh, process. Uh, so, and then the qualitative analysis, we're going to try to figure out how 
uh, or what the roadblocks are that the students are experiencing on the, the um, both effective and non-effective teams um, to see if we can eliminate those uh, that with uh, looking at the current literature. Uh, we're a, a new grant recipient, so we're not as far along as other uh, grant uh, presentations. Um, so I think I'm under time too. <laughs> Next is, going to be Next is going to be Sarah Douglas. You judge an online peer review too, Sarah. Actually, I only have one slide, so I'm going to be unique in that way. I know I only have three minutes, so I had to keep it simple for myself. Um, I am a professor in special education, assistant professor, and one of the things that we noticed about our students is they need to learn how to give good feedback because they're going to be teachers. And the classes that I teach, I'm working with all different kinds of education majors, providing them the special education content that they'll need to be effective and inclusive classrooms. So one of the, one of the things that we hope for in a classroom setting in the university um, is that these students would know how to provide effective feedback because that's something that they'll actually have to do as teachers to their students, as well as be able to take feedback that they receive as though they would receive it from their principal or a colleague and incorporate that feedback. So this particular tool is helping um, us create an online peer review tool that would help distribute and allow students to review their um, each other's work. It has several different tools that I think are kind of of interest um, and as part of the project we're reviewing different tools to kind of see what's out there and how we can improve what's already existing. Um, some of the things that we're looking to do is have double-blind peer review. Um, we're looking to be, have the ability to have faculty create rubrics to include in the tool, um, be able to do a review of reviews, so after review has been done, have the students review it again, um, allow time control features so that there are deadlines for students to meet, um, as well as um, having it compatible with a variety of media, allowing students to upload video or Word documents, different kinds of media that they use. Um, and allowed intelligent crowdsourcing. I think this is one of the most interesting features. If a student is an education, um, an uh, English education major, they would be exchanging work with other English education majors so that content um, is able to be looked at as well as the material and also to be SCORM compliant. Um, the things that we're doing um, this semester is we're currently reviewing existing tools and trying to find out um, what's out there, how we can improve things, what research has already been done. We've already had our first advisory meeting, meeting with um, people who are experts in the field and getting feedback from them about how we can create this tool and make it most effective for a large um, population of individuals, not just in education. And um, we are going to be creating a prototype and testing that in um, an online section of SPLED 419, which is an assistive technology course this summer. So we're hoping to get to that point, and after that we'll make revisions and continue to test and refine our product. Thank you, Sarah. So next is Carlene Maitland. Carlene is going to talk about MOOCs in STEM education, the intentions and motivations of develop, developing country students. There we go. Hi, I'm Carlene Maitland. I'm an associate professor in IST. And my broader research area is called Information and Communication Technologies for International Development. So I bring maybe a little bit of a different perspective to this kind of MOOC research. And so we were interested in studying, in particular, um, MOOCs in STEM education and the motivations of developing country students in this area. Now, of course, there are many um, different motivations that we can expect for STEM students. Um, and I think one is that uh, STEM education often has a, a tie into career goals and um, industry standards for uh, technical education. And so we're interested in how and why developing country students participate in STEM MOOCs. And um, we spent the summer kind of crawling through the forums of Anthony's uh, MAPS MOOC, and that's the, uh, the case study that we're, we're using now. And so we, when we were there, we found a real variety of motivations for those students. Um, everything from altruism, students were experiencing flooding in their village in Costa Rica and they wanted to help out and try and map flood zones so they could help out in that way. Others were more career oriented. And so these were just some of the initial findings that we 
what we have. Um, now we are in the process of trying to interview these students because we feel like a lot of the research uh, being done around MOOCs is relying on um, kind of the large scale data that we'll hear a little bit more about from BART. Um, so we wanted to actually get in depth and so we're, uh, we're starting to look at that. And some of the things we're finding, you know, little maybe design issues that um, we might be able to contribute to is um, uh, this morning we were interviewing a woman who's in China. Um, Coursera uh, links their videos through YouTube, which is blocked in China. So, you know, maybe we need to think about that. <laughs> um, what they, of course, they have workarounds, but do we really want to incentivize people to have workarounds? And that, that's something we can think about. Um, also, she was very appreciative of your text, extremely appreciative of your text. So keep that, that text up and coming. So this was just a map that um, Anthony had the students do at the beginning of the class, and you can see the uh, extreme geographic diversity of participation in the MOOC, and, and many, many of those students are from developing countries. Uh, we also have a diverse team, and we have people from education, as well as ISC, and of course, Anthony from geography. And so some of our research questions are looking at just motivations, why people are participating, um, trying to understand what kinds of demographic factors we can look at that might explain these differences. And then um, if any kind of industry norms around GIS are involved in their participation um, in that class. And so uh, we look forward to helping the rest of the MOOC community figure out who these developing country students are and what, what they're going to bring to the table. Thanks. Thank you, Carmen. Next, we're going to have Mark Purcell with Learning Analytics, leveraging big, leveraging big data to improve learners' success. Thanks. Thanks, Fred. There we go. Uh, so Learning Analytics, uh, for those that have not encountered this before, it's kind of an emerging field. Uh, and I'll give you the definition by George Siemens. He's kind of the godfather of this field. Uh, that Learning Analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners in their context for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning in the environment for which it occurs. So in a nutshell, we're collecting all this data about students, especially online as they move through our systems, but we really don't have many people looking at it. A lot of it goes kind of unexplored and unanalyzed, and that's kind of what we're trying to get at here, is to understand what's going on in some of these environments our students kind of live in, especially online, but as well as resident, and how we can understand that data to put better support infrastructures in place to help our students be successful. This is kind of the core of the team that we started with. The team is quickly snowballing. It's a popular field now. We have a lot of people coming into the project. But as you can see, we have folks from uh, ITS, different parts of ITS like TLT and ETS, uh, some folks from the College of Education helping with the design of kind of these prototype systems as well as educational psychologists. And down here at the bottom, we have members of the math department. This is where we kind of honed in on. Uh, as many of you might know, math education is kind of uh, not as good as it could be across the country. Uh, we look at Math 110, and on a bad semester, Math 110 might have, to have anywhere from 25 to 30 percent of the students not succeed, so they get a DF or withdrawal. So we feel like analytics can have a really fast impact on a course like this. So this is essentially where we are and where we're going. So what we've done so far is we have IRB approval uh, to get a whole bunch of historic data. So right now we're looking at data across about uh, two and a half years, current data from the fall semester of Math 110 as well as four past semesters of Math 110. And this data comes from the student information system, so things like uh, demographic information, things like information that uh, Penn State students put on their application, like SAT scores and things like that, as well as transcript data. What courses have they taken already? Uh, have they taken math courses? Is it the second time they've taken the course? And things like that. Uh, and then we have ANGEL data, which is really crazy when you start digging into all the things that's in ANGEL for these kind of courses. So we have things like login activity, grade data for quizzes and assess assessments, forum activity, we look at things like how many times are they emailing a TA or the faculty member, a lot of data like that, file interactions, what files are they looking at. One of the things other people find in this that we're looking at is depending on how quickly a student clicks on the syllabus is a big predictor of success in the course. If they do that within the first week, that's kind of an indication they'll probably be successful. So we're looking at data like that from Angel. Uh, this course is used with Piazza, uh, kind of a service. I don't know how many people are familiar with that. I think we'll hear from someone that has a grant around that later. But they're looking at Piazza as well. So we can pull a bunch of data down from Piazza and look at that information. And we're also looking at survey data. Our educational psychologist is asking questions about self-efficacy, academic buoyancy, all these different kind of effective traits. And we want to understand how much they play into this kind of analytics model. 
And so right now we're working on what we call day zero predictions. This is kind of predicting students' grades before they set foot in the class. And what we want to do is to be able to do this as accurately as possible and provide this data to the instructors. What we're going next, IRB round two, we want to build some software, some prototypes that we can actually put in front of faculty as well as students that let them see some of this data and use this data to make better decisions on how they interact with the course content and hopefully do better in the long run. Uh, and we're looking for funding and currently have an article abstract out to the Journal of uh, Computer Assisted Learning that takes some of the statistic techniques we're learning here and applying it to the mountain of MOOC data that we're collecting with Anthony's course and other courses. Thanks. Thank you, Bart. So next we're going to have Suzanne Scherf with using online learning technology to improve social skills for individuals with autism. What one? All right, so my name is Elizabeth White. Uh, Susie Scherf's actually teaching right now, so I'm a, her postdoc stand-in. Um, and so uh, Dr. Scherf and I are from the psychology department, and we ha are working with Joshua Smythe from Biowa Behavioral Health. Um, to look at how we can use um, educational online technology to build interventions for teenagers with autism. Um, so, so John Robinson wrote a book about his life um, having Asperger's and autism disorder. Um, he said, I don't really understand why it's considered normal to stare at somebody's eyeballs, right? So making eye contact and those sort of really subtle social cues that, you know, individuals with aut autism really sort of struggle and don't use appropriately in everyday life. Um, and so we can think about how can we intervene on that. Well, teaching someone to stare at someone in the eyeballs isn't necessarily the most helpful thing to do. We want them to learn how to use eye contact in meaningful ways. Um, so we have sort of um, data in the literature suggesting that individuals with autism spend a lot less time looking at the eye regions of faces compared to uh, typical individuals. Um, we, Dr. Scherf um, has designed interventions to improve face processing indirectly by um, intervening on sort of face-like cartoon figures. Um, and her intervention using computers to train up and recognizing the little purple greeble characters was fairly successful, except that the teenagers came back and said, you called this a game. This is not a game. This is not really fun. I'm just sitting here going, this is Bob, this is Joe, this is Bob, this is Joe, and it's kind of boring. Can you fix that? And we said, well, yes, we can take what we know about um, interventions and we can gamify it. We can turn it into a game. Um, and so we're working right now on building a game um, that uses um, real faces, uh, so sort of computer-generated faces, um, and we're going to teach um, individuals with autism to focus on the eye regions of faces um, by teaching them sort of the relevance of those gaze cues um, in sort of fun and interactive story-based um, video games so that it feels like they're playing but at the same time they're learning. Um, so to do this we have a consultant, um, Marcella, um, who's at uh, University Park Campus here and we have uh, Patrick Dawson from Blizzard Entertainment um, works on World of Warcraft and he has his two kids have autism and so he's giving us some insights from the uh, gaming industry on how we can sort of build something that's going to be fun from that end and educational from our end as researchers. Um, right now we have uh, the Penn State Barron campus um, undergraduate students are building our game um, with a uh, direction from Matthew White, who's their faculty advisor. So this semester, um, game design students started programming our game. Um, and one of the students actually has autism himself and um, can sort of bring to the table some ideas to sort of make a fun and educational um, intervention game program. Thank you. So next we're going to have Stephanie Shields with Wages Workshop Activity for Gender Equity Simulation. Actually, maybe I'll talk without. I don't need a mic. I'm used to teaching. Which okay. one is this? Is the top mic one? The mic for the recording. Ah, okay. Um, the top one? Yes. It can't count against me. The right button. All right. <laughs> the right button. Okay. There you go. Um, I'm Stephanie Shields. I'm in the... Uh, psychology department, uh, working with Marcella Borges, and uh, uh, Craig Ganow is the programmer who's working with us. And what we're doing is taking an empirically tested, successful 
learning game and transferring it to a virtual environment. Um, what's interesting about the game is that it is designed for faculty and, acad and uh, administrative decision makers in the university, and it is about, uh, it's teaching them about the way in which subtle um, inequities can pile up over the course of a career and cause uh, uh, very big problems for individuals, including um, re reflected including in, in their pay. And so many of the incidents on their own may seem uh, ambiguous or even trivial. Uh, unfortunately, the kinds of stereotypes that drive the biases that we all um, use in interacting with others are very difficult for us to control and good intentions are not enough to interrupt uh, their operation. And the only way we can really see these inequities develop is over the course of, of patterns of time. And I'm mentioning all of this because there are other sorts of difficult things to teach people that we're hoping to apply the uh, virtual environment to uh, later on. We've just started this semester. And wages is a board game. It illustrates the sources and cumulative effects of gender bias in the workplace. And um, the way it works is that you move up the academic ladder from postdoc to distinguished professor. You're on the green team or the white team. People choose cards. The cards represent the same instances that are experienced differently uh, depending on whether you're a female faculty member or a male faculty member. And all of the uh, information in the game is backed up by empirical research. We've also got empirical research on the effectiveness of the game of uh, training. Now our work plan is, um, Marcella would be much better at explaining this, the uh, looking at the whole learner. And what we are doing for our grant is uh, uh, gathering the requirements of the uh, game and proposing d uh, design alternatives and uh, developing and testing a prototype, which we hope to do next summer. To go from the physical world to the virtual world, we have to take the bicycle, take it apart, and put it back together again. And uh, what we're currently doing is breaking down wages, identifying the goals and the play-by-play -play kinds of events that occur. Uh, uh, the stakeholders and so forth, and we're using this collected information to produce a requirement, a set of requirements for uh, the digital version. So uh, as an example here, there's a flow chart that illustrates the uh, progress of gameplay, and uh, an, uh, an, on the right side is an artifact analysis, so actually going through what are the components of the game and how are they used and what do uh, they contribute to in terms of learning. So. Um, Thank you. Um, if you'd like to learn more about wages, please visit our website and uh, please email me. Thank you very much. So next we're gonna have Brian Smith with Improving Student Learning and Retention with an Adaptive E-Learning Platform. Well, I was thinking my hyper-minimalist approach w was a good idea, but I kind of regret it now. <laughs> uh, I also feel bad for not including the rest of my team. It uh, includes uh, Kathy Holsing from Lower Arts Outreach, as well as um, Amy Garbrick and Peg Fisher of IST. Uh, as the title suggests, we would be using adaptive learning technology to increase learning and retention. And that seems like an obvious good idea, but... Um, if you don't understand a few things about uh, the why and the how, uh, as was mentioned before, online students are presenting material in a static method, uh, usually one way. It's presented in, in, one, in one way, and they're usually assessed on that knowledge in one way or a limited number of ways. And the idea with uh, adaptive learning is um, there's a system that's, that's built that as the student moves through the materials, it's taking in data. It says, how long are they on this page? How long are they on that page? If they're given a practice question, how long does it take to answer? Um, what, do they get it wrong? Do they get it right? It's just, it's trying to figure out the student's experience as they move through the curriculum. 
And um, as we move into you know the future of online learning and increased um, enrollment, it's more and more seen as a, an effective and efficient way of teaching a large number of people uh, online. Um, so specifically uh, for complex or process-based um, curricula. Um, so in doing this, what we proposed was to find um, existing adaptive learning companies who are established in their field and who deal with post-secondary uh, education. And we came up with two, uh, one of which is Newton, which I don't need to introduce, it's Newton. And the other is uh, Smart Sparrow from, uh, and they're based out of Australia. Uh, Smart Sparrow was started by uh, Dr. Drar Ben Naim. He was a grad student at the time at University of New South Wales. And it just grew from there and sort of became too large for the university itself. It's now its own company. Uh, Dr. Ben Naim is the founder and CEO. Uh, it's being used by six or seven of the top universities in Australia and was featured in a um, course at Arizona State University. Um, so we wanted to ask two questions. Uh, the first was, which of the two systems worked best for Penn State, or at least for the College of Liberal Arts? Um, and we proposed developing one lesson for two existing courses and piloting those for one semester. Um, and from there, we developed 21 criteria that would rate the two systems and find out which worked better for everyone involved. Okay, that's, that was quick. And we go from there, and then we develop an entire course based on this one system, uh, pilot it for one semester, gather information on uh, student performance data, publish and present that data, and find out which system worked best and how to best use it for our needs for online learning. Um, unfortunately, there are some uh, roadblocks and delays in our, in our project. We're looking for uh, faculty buy-in and also some involvement with the Royal Canvas and with potentially Newton, which would increase the scope greatly. So hopefully next time I'll have more concrete uh, information to present. Thank you, Brian. So next is going to be Conrad Tucker, an investigation of digital and hands-on learning styles and their potential, in, potential impact on online education. Thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon. This is uh, joint work with my collaborator, uh, Gil Kramer, in the audience, and Kathy Jackson. And actually, it's a multi-university um, project with the University of Maryland, uh, Dr. Um, Linda Smith. So I remember a time when people used to play outside and work in their garages and take stuff apart? No, because neither do I. You know, we're moving towards an era of digital immersion. And the question that we're trying to answer is what is that doing to our uh, next crop of engineers? So right now we have two types of activities that take place in the engineering design curricula. We have digital learning, such as CAD and uh, other types of simulations. And we have physical product dissection. And the questions that we're trying to determine is, what is lost when we move towards this uh, physical to the digital world? Stuff like weight or texture. How does this affect engineers and ultimately our next generation workforce? So the two fundamental research questions that we're trying to answer are, what effects do hands-on digital learning have on student uh, learning? And once we've identified these differences, what technologies can exist to help mitigate these processes? So the first uh, preliminary work has resulted in a uh, uh, publication that we're working on where we have two different groups, uh, one involved in the uh, digital experience, uh, and we want to measure their learning outcomes, and a different group that's involved in the physical experiences. And we want to see and quantify what those differences are. And once we've quantified those, the next step is how do we uh, explore technology. So this is a uh, initial work that we've started working on where we've recreated Penn State. So this is a Hammond building, and this is actually geospatially accurate using Google and, and some um, algorithms. It's open source that we're developing. And what you're going to see here is an actual, so this is my student in my research lab, and we're using off-the-shelf hardware like the Microsoft Connect. So we're trying to bridge the gap between these two worlds of physical interaction and uh, the digital space. And this is towards a 
more haptic experience as we move towards this digital environment so we don't lose out on these added benefits of, um, of um, online digital immersion. So uh, we have some preliminary results, but we have a long way to go. As I mentioned, this is a joint work with uh, the University of Maryland and my collaborators here. And with that, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the COIL, of course, and other collaborators that have uh, provided input. So thank you very much. So next is going to be Daryl Velego with Scalable Assessment assessment in MOOC courses. Thank you for that introduction. This fall we are teaching a MOOC course here at Penn State. Uh, we have 120,000 students. Just estimating from the number of people in here, unless I can sign everybody up to volunteer to grade 1,200 projects, I think we're going to need to find a scalable way to do it. So the, the idea is can we learn something from Amazon.com about assessment? And our usual approach to assessment is we have the smart faculty member grading the, uh, the student or patient or whatever we want to call the, the person uh, with, our, with our models. And we do it one at a time and we use our expertise. Amazon does it very differently. They say we're going to allow any number of people to examine the, the product. We'll rate it one to five stars, and we'll add some, uh, the comments along with it. We want to examine, can we use that effectively to assess our students' projects? So our MOOC has a number of people in it, and the people on this uh, COIL grant include myself, uh, the other teachers of this MOOC, Jack, Mac Jack Matson and Catherine Yablikoff, Kyle Peck, Kate Miffitt helped us design the, the course and is working with us, and John Belanti, a psychologist. So we have 120,000 students in 150 nations, and that's the, the basis for what we're using to assess um, our, our research. The inspiration was, is from Amazon, and this is an example just looking up AAA batteries. I type in AAA batteries, and it gives me a range of, of alternatives. They're rated by stars, so Duracells are typically the ones I buy. I didn't even realize that Amazon sold their own batteries. So now I can look at these alternatives and start to examine the comments. Here we have nearly 100 comments. Here we have several hundred comments. So I can find not only alternatives quickly, but I can start to look at the comments for nuances, some of which I, as the expert, might not even be able to, to identify. People who are actually using these products, they're the ones who can identify it. The, the comments um, are in long form. They just keep running down the page, and I can examine all the way from high to low. I might find out that, that even though some people rated a certain product with one star, maybe it's not something that's relevant to me. Maybe it's a shipping problem or something like that that's not going to affect me for the most part. So we have two primary research questions. The first is, in taking a sample of those projects that, that we are receiving, as I grade them, as the other faculty grade them, we're going to have scores, we're going to have a certain number of comments, and we're going to have a certain quality of comments. Let's compare those with the comments and scoring from the many people who are grading this online through a discussion forum comments that they're posting. The other question that we're interested in is what is the value of these to students? What are the values of, the, of these comments to students? So we not only have summative comments, but we have formative comments all along the way uh, throughout the course of the MOOC that they can use to improve their project and to, and to develop it as they go. These are the two questions we're trying to answer. Thank you for, for listening. Thank you, Dale. So now to wrap up, I'm going to invite John Carroll with Supporting Dialectical Learning with Piazza. Hi, Jack. Hi, Fred. Thank you. Wrong way. <clears throat> I'm here with uh, Patrick Chi and also with Yu Wu, who are working with me on this project. So this is a uh, classroom uh, learning research project. and. 
we're, we're basically uh, trying to improve learning by uh, enhancing critical thinking through uh, a dialectical classroom activity. And this is building on earlier work we did with anchored discussion forums. Uh, here you see a short position paper written by a team of students, and in this case it's on crowdsourcing. Uh, it's called an anchored discussion forum because the discussion forum is anchored by an object of the which is the focus of the discussion. And you know, students carry out a conversation here, and we we like this as a uh, we call this learning conversation. It was uh, possible for it to go on obviously outside of class, and. Um, student engagement in, in learning for beyond the, the footprint of the classroom is one of our uh, objectives. So this new project, which we've just started this fall, is uh, uh, knowledge building in Piazza. Piazza, which has been referred to earlier, is a question answer uh, system. You see here uh, two panels, the question and the answer panel. We have uh, reappropriated this as a pro and con panel for a discussion. So one team of students posts a pro position, another team posts a con position. This example, by the way, was created by us to uh, help the students learn to, uh, to do this. It's based on the recent uh, PRISM uh, episode or scandal, whatever it is. Um, and so you see they're using a, uh, uh, a form of um, Toulmin uh, rhetorical structures here where they have uh, claims and warrants backing and so forth. So they're learning how to put together an, uh, an argument. Either each of these panes is a wiki so they can take several tries at it if they don't uh, nail it. And different teams are doing the pro and con positions. Okay, so that's just to give you a flavor of the, the activity that we're uh, exploring. Uh, this fall, I'm using it in the uh, honors section of the introductory uh, IST 110 uh, class with a group of freshmen. And uh, they have six uh, Piazza projects, uh, two involving uh, uh, deconstructing lectures that I gave, which uh, engaged them quite a bit, and uh, the other four uh, deconstructing topical books on uh, information technology. Um, and um, well, I've summarized here some of the, the uh, observations about the pro and the con, um, trying to get people to uh, get a, a sense of critical thinking. This is one of our main uh, pedagogical goals. We've noticed that this also leads to uh, uh, good classroom discussions. Of course, with dialectic, there's um, thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. The synthesis is in the classroom, which is the fun part, uh, I think. Um, and we've uh, noticed uh, some uh, indications of uh, pros and cons about Piazza, uh, retargeting it in this way. In the spring, we'll be expanding this work with two other classes. Uh, hopefully coming out with design recommendations for Piazza or for ourselves to build better learning technology and also improve this activity. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. So I, I've been rudely pushing people out of the podium because I want 10 minutes for me to talk in the, in the end. So I, I, I'd like to, so, to thank you all for presenting today or for submitting your proposals and, and work on your grants. So this is part of the spirit of COIL that me and Carl and Larry did. So we, we, we were presented with this big challenge to advance online innovation and learning with Penn State. And we knew that we couldn't do this ourselves. So we invite you to participate. And, and thank you very much for doing this. So I, I'd like Kyle and, and Larry to say something just for us to wrap up to our first COIL Research Symposium. All right, I'll, I'll jump in and say, uh, our goal was to stimulate a lot of innovation across different programs and to stimulate the, uh, the crossing of faculty, staff, and students, and academic. I, I think this demonstrates that we've done a pretty good job of that in just two semesters. First year, it's working. 
Uh, there are also statistics on how many different academic programs actually have submitted proposals or were involved in the submissions. It's a huge number. I should know it. I don't. It's like 60 different academic programs submitted proposals. So we really have, as we suspected, we have innovators here that can do what, uh, what Rita was saying. You know, we need lots of innovations. We need to be able to move in lots of different positive, productive directions. And we need to create ways to, s to differentiate ourselves from our competitors, both in other institutions and those that will appear from outside. So I want to thank everybody for uh, being pioneers and working with us. And I want to thank the university for re recognizing the need and creating the opportunity for us to do that. I think it's a, it's a wonderful group of people, and I really thank you. Uh, and I want to remind you that one of your obligations as uh, COIL PI, since I have you all in one room, and since we have another round of proposals coming up, is that you now get to move on to the ranks of reviewers of next round of proposals. <laughs> so remarkably few of you have actually signed up to do that. <laughs> So you will be hearing from me. You will not escape my, escape my recruitment efforts. So just a reminder, it's actually a really good thing, too, because you get to see a lot more creative ideas and find a lot of people who share your interests. And so it's a, it's a, you're going to love it. And we're off to do that again. Our, our next round of proposals is due November 1st. I think we have some prospective <coughs> grant writers in the audience today. I know we do. And I hope you've benefited from this as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Larry to close us out. Good. Thank you. And um, timing-wise, we're in good shape. Thank you so much for the time and energy and effort that you're putting into these projects. Uh, I know that uh, Craig Weideman in the back is one of the architects of COIL, along with uh, David Hall, dean of IST, and, and David Monk, dean of um, College of Education. And this was a, a desire, I think, uh, the organization was to create this synergy and collaboration. This is something that really hasn't been done uh, much in higher education in, in, in Penn State. We're really uh, happy to see you guys embrace this. One of the groups I'd like to point out is in the way back there. had a very interesting conversation yesterday with, with Powell. Will you put your hand up there? And about engaging students in this space. So I really want to kind of put a challenge out there for us to be thinking about as we're moving forward in new research ideas. Can we be drawing in our students as well along on these research projects? I saw lots of names up there of students, and that to me is really encouraging. And we're looking forward to, to more good ideas and generation uh, of new techniques coming from our students as well. So thank you, and uh, look for more great things to come from COIL. But one more thing before I end. If you have ideas, of what you'd like to see the organization doing, the group. We're three fairly approachable people. You know, bring ideas to the table. Throw, uh, give us a challenge of something to do. We'd love to hear that and embrace it. This is really a community effort. And uh, today really, I think, speaks to that. So uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right? Thanks and enjoy your day, folks.